Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Dr. William Snublin coming to you from With One Accord Church Ministries with a video in the realm basically of treasure guardians and also to a degree about spiritual warfare. And uh, as we're filming this, uh, the world seems to be getting a little bit scarier almost every day. We have news, both spiritual and geopolitical and even environmental. I, we just had this a couple of weeks ago, this horrible accident in Ohio. And we want people to know that we are praying for those people there in that part of the country, that we are really praying for them, that they would get the help that they need. Um, in any event, scary times. I mean, World War III might be looming. Uh, the Antichrist spirit is rising. We're going to talk about that in a couple minutes. But what do we do with all of this? Well, Yeshua gave us a admonition. And he said in John 16, 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Shalom. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, you know, when you're in the middle of, of, you know, and of course here in America we have been somewhat spared from some of the worst of this. But uh, right now there are more Christians being martyred in the world than at any time in human history. And with all this going on, we're supposed to be of good cheer. Because we know that Yeshua has overcome the world. But the key point in there is he says that we need to be in him to have shalom. Now, how does that happen? The key thing to remember is if he overcame the world and we are in him, then so to speak by proxy, we can overcome the world. But it's a it's a potential that we need to realize through multiple, you know, avenues that the scriptures have given us. One interesting thing of all of this is if you go through, and of course this is about the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, you will see that every place where the word overcomer or overcometh or whatever you might find in the King James Bible in Greek, the word is nikio, which is, you know, related to the word that we have for our sneakers, Nike. Well, not my sneakers, but, you know, it's a very popular brand. It means conqueror. It means overcomer. And, in fact, Nike is actually the name of the Greek goddess of victory, which, you know, whether or not that would keep you from buying the shoes, I don't know. But I would never buy them because they're made in horrible sweatshops and some place like China. I don't know. Anyhow, the point is, it means to be a conqueror. And there's this whole thing that surrounds that word that, that we need to get in a little bit more of a handle on. So how do we access this, this incredible promise that, you know, and because we, you know, if you study church history, whether just in the last several hundred years, if you go all the way back to the apostles in the post-apostolic period, you see all of these, I mean, thousands, tens of thousands of examples of believers that went through all kinds of persecutions, all kinds of torments, and, and martyrdom, sometimes horrible martyrdom, and they were of good cheer. They would be you know, going through all of these things, singing hymns of praise to Elohim. And, and we look at that, and I mean, a lot of people don't even read that stuff, but it's it's all there to be seen in various, you know, historical documents. And it, it's really very inspiring. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how we can take scriptures and access this beautiful promise that Yeshua gave us, that, that we can overcome the world in him. So, first of all, the scriptures have provided us many different avenues for this, which is awesome. Uh, to begin with, we read in Paul, 
in Romans 12, 21, he says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, many of us have heard that verse, and, you know, it sounds good, but, but the interesting thing about it is, is that Yeshua, and this is from Matthew nineteen seventeen. He was, you know, confronted by a Jewish leader and called him good master. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And what did Yeshua say? He said, why callest thou me good? There are none good, but one, even Elohim. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And that's going to kind of be a theme throughout these different overcoming passages. But let me just highlight that because we use the word good a lot, you know, even to the point that, you know, someone sees us and says, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. No, you're not. You're really not good. You might be well, you might be healthy, you might be happy, whatever, but nobody is really good even if you're a very devout believer, you, because you can only be good in Yeshua. You can only be good if he is within you, empowering you through the armor of light and the garment of light and the full armor of Elohim that we have talked about on our videos. The, only then can you be good. So, up right up front, if we are to fulfill Romans 12, 21, and overcome evil with good, we need to be conscious of Elohim being in us and being with us, and that is the promise. In John 17, Yeshua says that he and the Father will come and live in us, that He, we will be with him. More about that later. But So if we are aware of that, and most of us, we might have a... Um, a cognitive idea about that because we've read it. You know, most I hope most all of you have read through the Bible, at least the New Testament, and we uh, we've read these things. And hopefully, those truths have have penetrated, have percolated into our hearts. But you know, even though we know those things on an intellectual level, we need to appropriate them more deeply into our ruach, into our spirit, into our soul and make them real, and walk them out by by making an effort. And it, it is, it's an effort to consciously direct our minds toward Yeshua, toward Elohim, toward his precepts and his teachings all the time. Now, I know a lot of you have, have jobs and demands upon your life that require you to use your noodle for other things, whether it's, you know, writing, or, I mean, I do this, I have, I, I, I write and I teach and I, you know, do things relating to keeping the records of the, of our church, et cetera, et cetera. But even then, I, I mean, I try to always have the thought of Yeshua being in me and with me and for me, always near the forefront of my mind. That's powerful if you can do that. And I know it's not, it's a, it's something you have to work on because the devil is just great at throwing distractions at us, whether they're the, the old, quote unquote, old fashioned distractions of, of job or crises or a car breaking down or a loved one being ill or maybe even you being ill any of these things. And of course, nowadays, we also have our phones and all of this stuff to just constantly distract us. So we need to make a conscious effort to be moving through life with him conscious that he is in our heart and that his name should be continually on our lips. Because if his name is in our heart and on our lips, we will be less likely to spew forth some garbage. You know, whether it's gossip or whether it might be taking his name in vain. I mean, yeah, forbid either of those things. You need to have a sanctified tongue, sanctified lips, and a sanctified heart. Strive for these things. By doing that, Yeshua will enable you to keep the commandments. Okay, another passage. 
one John, and you'll notice most of these things are from John's writings, either, you know, his epistles or the gospel or the book of Revelation. But in 1 John 2.14, we read this. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of Elohim abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. And of course, there's that word again, overcome. So there's some key points here. Number one, we need to know Elohim as much as is humanly possible. Of course, nobody can totally know him while we're down here on the earth. And, you know, if we were to encounter the fullness, even the fullness of Yeshua, our minds would probably explode. But to the extent that we are able, through studying his word, memorizing and memorizing his word, and also prayer, I mean, if you want to know someone, you also have to talk to them. And as I'm sure you've heard people say, when when you read the scriptures, it's Elohim talking to you. And then when you pray, it's, you know, us talking to him. We're having a, or at least we should be, having a conversation with him. So he's saying here, we need to know Elohim. And that means a deep knowledge to the extent that we are able, not just, oh yeah, I know there's God out there somewhere. I mean, you know, no, we're not talking about being a deist or something like that. No, we're talking about someone who, who is endeavoring to know Elohim on a really deep level. So that's part of it. Another part of this passage is it said that, that we are in this situation because the word of Elohim abideth in us. And of course, there again, we're talking about the scriptures. All of course, Yeshua himself is the word of Elohim. But here's the thing. The word there abideth, even in English, but more so in, you know, both the way the, the, the Yeshua obviously gave this discourse in Hebrew, or Aramaic, I'm not sure, uh, and it's in the in Greek, you know, in, in the scripture. But the idea of abideth is that it's something that stays. It's something that's continually there, something that endures. And that's important because it's saying basically not just, that, okay, you read a passage of the scripture and you go on. You need to constantly endeavor to have it in your heart, to memorize it, to you know, have as I, I heard one preacher say, you know, you want to have Bible verses in your heart like an archer has arrows in his quiver. So whether you're witnessing to somebody, whether you're praying, whether you're teaching, you need to be able to, you know, pull out an arrow and like that. Have them there where you can readily use them. Have you know, like, you know, David said, thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. So that's part of this whole thing. If the word, it says, you overcome because you are strong. And how are we strong? We're strong in the, the almighty and the power of his might. You know, as it says in Ephesians 6, and the word of Elohim abides in you. So that's a key component. So, if we do all of these things, then we will overcome the wicked one and his minions. All right. 1 John 4, 4. Ye are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, a lot of us, we quote that passage a lot, but I think we need to, again, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, because it's obviously a true passage, but we need to understand that the three verses that preceded, the first three verses of 1 John 4, talk about basically dangerous things. The Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, worldly elements, and also people that are correcting the Bible and denying the resurrection of Yeshua. And there are a lot of people out there. Not, and I don't, I don't just mean people that aren't Christians. 
you know, there are a lot of Christians now that are denying the resurrection. I mean, yeah, forbid. That is one of the cornerstones of our faith, and yet they deny it because they've fallen into the trap of 1 John 4, 1 through 3 that it's talking about. So, we are to overcome these wicked things. That's what he's talking about here when he says, and I have overcome them. That's what he's talking about, the first three verses. So, number one, we are to overcome these worldly things by not being of the world. You know, like it says in James 4.4, 4, if you have friendship with the world, you have enmity with Elohim. And that means we shouldn't try to be worldly. And I, let me just say this for a moment, because I know there are churches, they tend to be more in the charismatic wing of uh, Christendom, that, that say, oh, well, you've got to, you know, so we can draw people into the church, you can't dress funny. You've got to dress successfully you know whether you're a man or a woman you got to dress in a certain way and you know have a little flash you know what however you want to call it and you know it's funny because as you know i've been a student of cults for decades for you know ever since the 19 mid 1980s and there was a concept years ago which probably a lot of you never even heard of it's called flirty fishing <laughs> and it was originated by a guy named Moses David, who founded this weird cult that was called the Children of God. It was an offshoot of the, the Jesus people, you know, thing that, that came about in the, I think it was in the early 70s, late 60s, kind of, they were like Jesus hippies. And this particular offshoot was very bizarre. And what he would do is he called, he would, he would send because he had a lot of, he, the guy was almost like a, a sort of pseudo-Christian version of Charles Manson. And he attracted all these young people and a lot of, you know, young teenager, early 20s age girls. And he would send them out and have them go into taverns and pick up guys and take them back on the allure that, that they would have sex with them. And often they would. And then as they were, you know, seducing these guys, they would try to convert them to this bizarre cult form of Christianity. And he, this Moses David guy, called this flirty fishing because it's like he said, oh, you'd cast a hook into the water and you'd get a fish and you pull them in. Well, unfortunately, these churches that try to be worldly, whether it's the way they dress or their music or the glitz that they, you know, all the, the stuff they use to make their churches seem snazzy. And, I mean, I know I'm being old-fashioned here, but, you know, it's okay to be old-fashioned when you're trying to promote the truth of the gospel. And all of this stuff they're doing, it's a, it's a more mild, innocent form of flirty fishing. They're trying to be more worldly so that they can throw out a hook and pull somebody in. But the problem is, Research shows that these huge mega churches that are seeker friendly, typically people go there, they stay there a couple weeks and they leave. If they ever got born again, who knows? But they wandered off. And they're probably like the people, you know, that are in the parable about the three different soils that Yeshua used, you know, where they, they got picked up by the birds and carried off. Because these churches do not know what holiness is, do not they do not know what real discipleship is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, anyway, don't be worldly. Be set apart from the world. Be outspoken in your Christian faith. Live your faith out loud, and it don't just mean, you know, standing on a street corner with a signboard saying, you know you know, repent, Jesus is coming. I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. But I'm talking about more subtle things because we need to draw people in by the spirit of Yeshua that's within us, not by being successful looking or, or you know, having a snazzy suit or an attractive dress or whatever because that attracts the spirit of the world. We want to attract the tiny flame of Yeshua that's in every person 
that cometh into the world. That's according to John chapter 1. So, so in addition to those other, I kind of went off there, but <laughs> in addition to that, don't be worldly. Also, don't use fake anti-Messiah Bibles. Don't deny the resurrection. And, and believe it or not, there are, you know, the vast majority of Bibles. The last verse that I just quoted, you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the vast majority of these modern Bibles subtly will deny the resurrection in one way or the other. And that's a subject for another talk. In 1 John 5, 3, we read, For this is the love of Elohim, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of Elohim overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Yeshua is the Son of Elohim? This is he that came not by water and blood, even Yeshua HaMashiach, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness, pardon me, that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay, key points from this passage. Number one, again, we have to keep the commandments. N number two, the stronger we get spiritually, it's like a, a loop. The more you keep his commandments, the stronger we get spiritually. The stronger we get spiritually, the more we are able to keep the commandments. And, you know, whether it's prayer, whether it's fasting, whether it's living a set-apart life, the more you do each one of these things, the stronger you will get in your spirit and the more likely you will be to keep doing them. You're building up a momentum like a flywheel. Okay, next point. We need to be genuinely born again, regenerated by the Ruach HaKodesh. And, you know, that's basically a matter between you and Yeshua. But I'm afraid there are a lot of people that, that are out there that they think they're saved and they're not. And that's not their fault. It's the fault of the preachers and the, some of these evangelists that are kind of preaching a false message. But that's not where I want to go today. The other thing, as you'll notice there, is the idea of faith. We have to have faith in him, in Muna. We need to be faith, have faith, and we need to be faithful because that's, that's the dual component of that word. Um, as James says, faith without works is dead. So that's another part. We also need to believe in the Trinity as it is expressed in verse 7. And again, you will find that many of the most popular Bibles that are out there have removed 1 John 5, 7 from the Bible. Or they've put a footnote in that casts doubt on it. And that is right out of the pit of hell. And if you have a Bible like that, you need to throw it in the trash or throw it in, you know, a burning pile or something. I don't know. Anyway, because such a Bible is contaminated with the spirit of Antichrist, which is what the previous passage in 1 John 4 is warning us about. So, be sure you read that passage and believe in the Trinity. And I, I understand the doctrine of the Trinity is not easy to believe, I mean, or to understand. You know, it's hard to wrap your mind around three persons and one Elohim. But it's all through the Bible. It's not just a... New Testament thing. I mean, you can find it all through the scriptures. So, anyhow, that's, again, a thing for another time. Now, to kind of bring this to a close, I just want to show you how critically important it is to be an overcomer, to be a conqueror. Okay? If we read the promises that are given by Yeshua himself to his seven churches, that are actually churches that that John the Beloved was a bishop, an overseer over, in Asia Minor, we'll find some interesting and, and inspiring stuff. I'm going to try and close with this. You know, uh, he's writing to the church in Ephesus. 
This is chapter 2, verse 2 of Revelation, of course. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of the life, which is in the midst of the garden. Now that's an incredible promise. Because through eating of the tree of life, we have all sorts of, not, it's not just about living forever, because we have that in Messiah. If you are a born-again person, you have immortality in him. But there's more to it than that, to be able to eat of the tree of life, which is for the healing of the nations, we're told later on in the book of Revelation. So we need to be able to do that. And to do that, we need to be an overcomer and to partake of these deep inner mysteries that are part of this tree of life. Okay, he then writes to the church in Smyrna, and this is verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt with the second death. I think we kind of understand what that means, but it essentially means that the people that go through the judgment, and at the end of time, they will, if they are born-again individuals, they will go on to live with Yeshua forever in resurrected bodies. But if they're not, they will partake of the second death, which will not be a good thing because it will end them up in the lake of fire with the devil and all of his angels. Okay. Um, the church in Pergamos, this is the long one. He says, To him that let, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Okay. Well, what's the hidden manna? Well, the hidden manna is the Lord's Supper, the, the table of the Lord, the Eucharist, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, that's a critical component in every, in every believer's life. Beyond that, this second part, I'm going to decode it for you at the very end of this talk, so hang in there about the, the white stone and the, the new name. Okay? So be patient. The next church was Thyatira. This is from verse 29 of chapter 2. He that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Hallelujah. And of course that again means that to keep his works means to keep his commandments. Sardis, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father, my Father and before his angels. Now that, again, is an amazing promise because, you know, we always have these almost cartoonish images of people in heaven all wearing white robes, but this is saying that's the case. It's not just, you know, something out of a chick comic. And at the same time, it is also saying that your name will not be blotted out of the book of life if you're an overcomer. And I don't think anybody listening to this wants to have their name blotted out of the book of life. Okay, the church in Philadelphia. This is verse 12 of chapter 3. To him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my Elohim, and he shall go out no more, and I will write upon him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, which is New Yerushalayim, which cometh down out of heaven from my Elohim, and I will write upon him my new name. So again, this beautiful but cryptic promise, you know, that, that, that he will, if you are an overcomer, you will become a pillar in the temple of Elohim. Now that's probably metaphorical, but the idea again of, of a, is a pillar is something that's strong, that's dependable, and that supports. And it's going to stand forever. I mean, they're, 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 you know, monuments in, in ancient Greece that have been there for the pillars, these Corinthian pillars that have been there for, you know, like two millennia. That's what a pillar is all about. It's strong, it's sturdy, and it's dependable. And it's part of his temple. 
Are you part of his temple? If you're an overcomer, you will be. And again, it says, I will write upon him my new name. Now that's a different name. And we're not going to get into that this time. We're going to try that another time. Okay, to Laodicea, this is the last one. To him that overcometh, this is verse 21, yeah. I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So here again, right back to the very beginning of this talk, the verses I was citing, because we are in him, in Yeshua, in Yeshua, we are overcomers. And because we are in him, we can sit with him, hallelujah, in heavenly places. That's promised to us in Ephesians on the Father's throne. And in fact, we are seated there right now. Even though we don't sense that usually, we don't know that, but that is what we are told in scriptures. And I believe it. That's why if we walk in him and with him and keep in his word and keep in prayer and all the things that you're seeing here, that, that we, will, we will be overcomers because we will, we will be so profoundly and deeply in him that nothing can touch us. Nothing can touch us. So, to close, one level of this, this name thing that's mentioned that I want to just unpack briefly. The one name that's mentioned is this new name that he will give you if you're an overcomer. And that name, paradoxically, is the same name he gave to our forefather, Yaakov, Jacob, in the book of Genesis. And that name is Israel. If you are born again and you're an overcomer, you are part of Israel. Now, why do I say that? Well, because if you look at the, you know, again, this is one level of this. There's more than one level with every Bible passage. It's layers within layers of wonder and beauty and awe. But with this name, Israel, um, I remember way back when I was, you know, in Bible school, I was told it means basically he who wrestles with God, with El, is the Hebrew word, and wins. And that was later on confirmed to me years later by a Messianic rabbi. But that could be taken in two ways, because obviously we all know the story. Jacob wrestled with that angel and he won. But it can also mean that if you are an overcomer, it's because you are wrestling with God in the sense that God is your spar is your your tag team partner. That was the word I was looking for. He is with you in the fight. It doesn't mean you're fighting with him necessarily. It means he is with you in the fight. And because he is with you in the fight, you can be an overcomer against the world, the flesh, and the devil. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, as John the Beloved writes. So that's, the, that's one of the ways you can look at that new name thing, is that you can appropriate that you are one of the ones that have wrestled with God, and you have won in the sense that you, are def you have defeated, you will defeat, and you will continue to defeat the evil one. And I want to close with one final passage. And you read in Romans chapter 8, and again, this is fairly familiar, but I want to just highlight it in the light of what we just were talking about. In Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Messiah? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. More than conquerors. Now let me just, you may know this, you may not, but I, this, this is so exciting to me. That term, if you look at, at the Greek expression there, it's 
Hooper Nikhail. Now, Hooper is where we get our word hyper. And that doesn't mean just someone that's like jumping around or whatever. Hyper means way above the norm. So what they're saying here, what, what the, pot, the apostle is saying, is that we are way above being conquerors because it's through him who loved us, even though we're going through, you know, and I know some of us are going through really hard times and, and you know, we're struggling and we're frightened. But you look at the list that's here, you know, in verse 35, you know, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword, all this stuff. And all these things, we are more than conquerors. We are hyper conquerors through him who loved us. Hallelujah. Okay, I hope this was encouraging and empowering to you, brethren and sisters. Um, we just ask you to please pray for us. Uh, we need your prayers very much. Uh, and if you th kind of find this kind of teaching helpful, please subscribe if you have not done so. Please share it with as many people as you can. And also, again, we would pray about, we would ask you to pray about doing something in the way of supporting the work we do. And again, we have um, our website, and through that you can uh, do PayPal, and we're looking into some other things as well. And additionally, we also have a text to give where you can send us money uh, through your smartphone in a perfectly safe way, and you will find the, um, the number right there. So again, remember, you are more than conquerors through him, not because of anything, you know, great that you are. But you're more than conquerors through him who loves you. Keep that in your hearts as we go into the days ahead. And I pray that Yeshua blesses you richly in every part of your life. Shalom, shalom.